thank you all for joining us on this first Friday. Mm -hmm. Julie Lawtons will lead us into our coherence moment and to state of mind. So with that, Julie. Thank you, Janice. Welcome everyone. Here we are midday on Friday. Delighted to hear from Dave and Angie today. And I invite you to join me in a short coherence practice to help us all settle and, and be present for this meeting. I'll invite you to find your feet on the floor. You might try pushing on the floor just a little bit, activate legs, notice where your bottom is on the chair, just letting the body settle. Paying attention to the body, letting the letting our, our being drop out of our minds and into the, the fullness of our being and our body. And take a deep breath in and a longer exhale out. Inhale in. Out. Little attention to the neck and the shoulders, just letting everything drop. One last breath in and out. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Just a quick reminder of who's in the room. So it's the Corentis Global Community of Professionals Advancing Team Effectiveness. So all of us here are passionate about effective teaming and the bringing people to work better together. So some of the people who are in the room are from some of these programs. Um, a little announcement for those who are not uh, aware of this. We have a new community platform. So we're going from uh, the platform being on Squarespace to the platform being on Disco. One, because we just love the fact that there is a community platform called Disco. We share quite a bit of Corentus IP and the events and, and these are all um, there. So please join us there or if you're already a member, join us there as well. So what we will be doing today is we will be doing our state of mind check-in and Julie will take us through that conversations with a thought leader. So very, very excited to introduce you to Angie MacArthur and to have her share with us. And then at the end, we will have a mindfulness moment to take you back to where you once were. Okay, and with that, I bring you Julie to take us through State of Mind. <laughs> it's our, thank you, Janice. It's our custom and practice to open our team meetings and our first Friday meetings with a state of mind check-in. And this is a reminder to each of us as practitioners of the importance of knowing where we are in our energy and mood and being before we engage with a team uh, or with a client. And in this chart, the way we, we understand this chart is that sometimes our energy and, and mood are in a balanced state, which we call neutral. If we're below the line in energy and mood, we are a minus one, minus two, or minus three, depending how below the line we are. And if we're above the line, we are a plus one, plus two, plus three. And with that, I invite you to check in with yourself and see where do you fall on this map? of states of mind, which has been developed through research over the years with our clients. What number would you say you are? Is it a plus one, satisfied, calm, content, or maybe something below the line? And when someone is below the line, we offer, I'll offer privately in chat support, and please feel free to take us up on that. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. And with that, is with great, great pleasure to introduce you to, to our thought leader today on this lovely first Friday, Angie MacArthur. 
Um, for over two decades, Angie and her team have supported leaders, teams, and organizations from Google and GE to the Society uh, for Organizational Learning and Department of Defense. Um, they support these clients by designing and facilitating global conferences, train their leaders, and engage them as one-on-one -on -one thinking partners. Angie is also the co-author co of two amazing books, along with her co-author, uh, Dr. Duana Mar um, Mar Markova, and she has co-authored Collaborative Intelligence and Reconcilable Differences. On a personal note, in May of 2023, I was looking for an inspiring summer reading and a really good friend recommended Collaborative Intelligence. I started listening on Audible and I was hooked. However, there was a problem. I found myself constantly taking notes I need to take a spiral notebook with me every time I was listening to Audible, going on a, a long walk, and I, I just couldn't do it anymore. So I bought, I bought the book, and I, and I calmly listened to the rest of it without feeling as though I had to make notes on every five minutes. And then I read the book, underlining, highlighting, and making notes practically every page. And so when Brian told me over this summer that Angie had registered for our core training program, our team coaching core training program. I was like over the moon. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. And so I immediately asked Angie if she could be our thought leader for this month. And so it is with absolute privilege to have her here today as our first Friday thought leader, Angie. Oh my gosh, what an introduction. Um, thank you, Janice. And um, it's funny because the root of the word question is quest. And I feel um, we have been on traveling on a similar quest um, with this work for a long time now. And um, so it's a joy to be part of this Corentis community. As Janice said, I just joined the, the um, team training. I have loved it. And it's really fascinating to me because what I've noted about the Corentis team is that they exemplify so many of these characteristics that we've tried to grow in our work on collaborative intelligence. So um, it's you know just a privilege to be a part of this community and I look forward to diving in deeper with all of you and of course my cohort in the, in the team training. So I just wanted to start today by, I mean, obviously you're all practitioners, you've been deeply involved in this work yourselves. And just would love for you to share in the chat, when you have had an extraordinary collaborative moment with another person, a team that you yourself have been a part of, so not facilitating, but you've been engaged part of the team. What are some of the qualities that you noticed were there? What were some of the dynamics that were present that really helped make that collaboration extraordinary for you? So oh, just please share all of your thoughts um, in, in the chat, building wisdom. Um, I did also want to mention uh, my, my partner um, and husband, David Peck, is on, on, on this call as well. We work together, and um, so it's a, always a joy to have him join, um, and he'll kind of help keep me on track and also, um, you know, maybe respond to some of the, the, the chats here. Great. Lack of ego, empathy, flow, curiosity. Yeah, sparkles of energy. Great. So this question of what creates high quality collaboration, we started looking at 30 years ago. Dr. Markova came from the world of um, really understanding diversity of thinking. She's a neuroscientist, psychologist. So really applying a lot of the basic theories there to what really, how do we even understand and recognize differences so we can achieve collaboration. I come from the communication background. So what I want to share with you today is a couple of the um, strategies and insights that we have to hopefully maybe spark some ideas for you. And also to really drive what we became so interested in is what helps teams real time in the moments where they're thinking together. So this isn't a theoretical exercise, but really the application of these tools and these frameworks, how do we grow the intelligence for collaborating in the moments? How we define collaborative intelligence, and this definition took a long time to sort of formulate, 
is the measure of our ability, each of our ability to think with those who think differently on behalf of what matters to us all. And that behalf of what matters to us all is a really critical component, right? And I think in the Carentis model, it's sort of that common purpose and shared goals that kind of resides in the center of that circle. But it has to matter for us to step into this space of collaboration. One of the things <clears throat> that is really important as we look at collaboration is it's a space to enter. And sometimes people just use it like as a descriptor of someone, they're highly collaborative or they're not so collaborative. And that's all well and good. But when we're working with teams to say, we are now moving into a collaborative space, kind of like an Aikido sensei who says, we are now stepping onto the mat. It's a different presence, a different intention, because then we can hold some principles, some edges around what that what creates that collaboration to happen, which is different than a meeting for information or a different, you know, there's tons of different kinds of meetings that we can have. But when we're trying to encourage teams to really collaborate, to create the space to do that, what we're really asking for is for them, again, to understand what is how they're relating to one another. So these three cardinal rules are what help create a collaborative mindset, how we relate to one another. And many of you kind of have um, different descriptors here in the chat that, that all um, relate to this particular word. But I know I, I know I can't change another person, but I can always grow my capacity to relate and dig in with them, to respect one another. So you can't make people like, or even, you know, um, un, well, we can hopefully try to have them understand us. But to to um, I can always find ways to respect myself in the moment and to respect the other person because without respect and I so appreciated um, the last week or last month's um, thought leader um, Heidi Gardner when she was talking about the different uh, trust components competence and character and so so much of character is that sort of always holding respect and respect of others, respect of ideas, respect of differences to, um, to a high standard. And then of course, valuing differences. And this one's really interesting because in our, in our research and our work and writing the book, Collaborative Intelligence, this people will say, of course, I love differences. I have an open mind. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm completely to open to all possibilities, but real time, what we actually experience is people get very narrow quickly and when differences show up, it can often cause a lot of frustration. So we kind of have to constantly remind ourselves and our teams that we're working with, what does it look like to really value differences? How do you put intentionality around that? So again, I can't always prove to another person that I'm right, but I certainly can respect our, our differences. In the domain of communication, I um, one of the differences that we find is that the image or the understanding of what I'm communicating in the moment feels like this beautiful picture. And ironically, I didn't realize it until I saw Janice's background, but this looks very much like the current uh, background on, on the uh, Zoom feed. Um, but what it can often feel, sound, and look like to other people is just that heap of puzzle pieces. And so part of collaborative intelligence is the patience and the supporting of teams to dig in and help put these puzzle pieces together. So we're not just making these picture perfect assumptions um, that create breakdowns. And I'm gonna go into a little bit um, to this model in a second of one of the ways that we can help support do that. So this is the cycle of communication. This may look very familiar to many of you. Um, but I constantly just am holding this framework in the back of my mind as I'm working with teams because so often what is spoken or what is shown as we live in a very visual uh, communication world, what's emailed, text in the Slack feed, or what's expressed physically and what is heard, or if you expand on that to our other senses, what's actually seen and felt is often not the same. 
And that leads to misunderstanding and leads to agreement breakdowns and action confusion, all of those other things. So when I'm with a team or even in my one-on-one -on -one coaching, I'm constantly going back to, let's go back to what was spoken. Let's go back to what you read. Let's go back to kind of your physical, what you think you demonstrated in that moment. And what did this, perhaps this other person heard? Where was some of the breakdowns? So this cycle is just a constant support for my own work in really helping individuals and teams build understanding. One of the things that Dr. Markova and I, and this is research from, she's been doing this research for 50 years on really what creates some of the differences in communication. Most of us pay attention to what is communicated, the words, the meaning of what we're saying. Very few of us pay attention to how we're communicating. And I think as coaches, many of you are probably in this whole world of sensing, sensing what's going on, are much more tuned into a lot of this than perhaps, you know, even the teams that you work with. But for today's session, I just wanted to highlight, this is one of the strategies we write about in collaborative intelligence to give you some uh, broaden awareness of maybe some things that are going on in how we're communicating that are leading to both team breakdown, perhaps even team coherence, because we of course wanna repeat patterns that are working. So the work we call mind patterns is really the unique way that you process information and communicate it has nothing to do with personality has nothing to do with gender any of these things it's literally how your brain is sequencing information so you can learn and each one of us are different and so when we bring a team together this sort of compounds breakdowns and confusion that can happen so some of the common breakdowns that happen without awareness of this model is when a person raises their voice and doesn't stop talking, I may shut down. I hear complaints a lot with clients of, gosh, I put all this energy and time into sending this beautiful email and they just sent me back a two word response, go for it, that's fine. And they feel disrespected. They send incredibly detailed spreadsheets and PowerPoints and expect me to just get it, I don't get it. Or, they talk in circles, or when we get into meetings, we seem to just kind of go on this auditory crazy journey and don't really get to the point, or I'm missing the point. Do any of these sound familiar to you folks? Please, you know, share in the chat what breakdowns you kind of notice with through this lens of, of communication. Um, another common one is people are moving around, and so they seem disengaged. I'm a mover and I did not realize how often until I got exposed to this model. I was that kid in school who was always considered a disruptor because I literally, it was really difficult for me to sit still. And so, but moving is my way of communicating. It's my way of being in the world. And so um, if you didn't know that about me, you may think I'm actually distracted. Another one that's very common, and I noticed this was on the Corentis, um, one of the models that we did in our teamwork, is some for some people, it's very easy for them to interrupt others and for others and finish other sentences, right? And for some, that actually is, it feels, it kind of feels bad in the moment. But these are all ways in which we're constantly communicating in the world and we're putting things out but for others, they may not be working. Yeah, so I'm saying people, yes, work at home. And we have a whole, this whole body of work is available um, for families as well. We have these family toolkits. And so, yes, this work constantly helps us understand not only our, our people at work, but our, our whole family systems as well. So we're going to dive a little deeper into this model now. And um, many of you, this will obviously sound very familiar. We have three ways we're constantly taking in the world, auditory, telling, singing, discussing, listening, hearing. There's auditory receptive, auditory active. There's kinesthetic, which is the receptive parts are smelling, tasting, feeling, sensing. The active are kind of hands-on, sports, moving, doing. 
visual, obviously receptive, watching, reading, taking it in, active, writing, drawing, you know, photography. And we've all heard those phrases. I'm a visual learner. I'm a hands-on learner. And that is really aligned with this model, but it's only part of the story. And so what I want to share with you now, what most people aren't familiar with, yeah, there's great stuff going on in the chat here simultaneously, but because it's hard for me to visually multitask, I'm going to keep my my eye on you all and, and let Dave sort of respond to the chat as it's going on. Um, so on the next slide, we have um, the different brainwave states. And this is kind of the part of the model that a lot of people haven't been exposed to. And I have this beautiful toy. It's actually not even a toy. This um, this is called a Hoberman sphere, for those of you who haven't seen it. This was actually in the 2001 Olympics in Salt Lake City, which is where I live in Park City, Utah. He created the award stage and it would open up like this when the medalist would stand on the stage and then close when the medal ceremony was done. But what we have found with this Hoberman sphere is it's a great way to demonstrate how our brains are constantly firing. And so we have this very alert state of attention. This is called beta waves. This is where we're very sequential, where we can handle a lot of detail. Sorting attention, or what we might call confusion, is where we're kind of trying to understand something. We're taking it in probably where a lot of your brain waves are right now. Listening to me, looking at the visuals, trying to integrate it into your own life experience. I love group confusion. I often say to a team, I can't wait till you're all confused. <laughs> and they kind of look, in our culture, we hate confusion. If you want help, you just say, I'm confused. And you'll have 20 people help you trying to get unconfused. But confusion or sorting attention is the step before insight. This is open attention. This is where we're creating theta waves. This is where we're attaching things to our own deep wisdom. This is where understanding comes from. This is where ideas are generated. This is where you're like, oh my gosh, where did I leave my car keys? And you stop thinking about it, but then two seconds later, you have the answer. Has anyone had the experience where they've been really trying to solve a problem and then they go take a shower or go out on a walk or they're talking to someone else about something completely different and then that idea comes? that's when your brain is producing this very open imaginative state. And we go through these three states constantly. What this model helps us understand is there's different stimuli for each of us that help us move into these states. So for some, talking or being um, verbally present helps them actually pay attention. They can't wait to speak. They want to be talking. My partner, Mary Jane Ryan, can be on the phone for nine hours straight, and she doesn't even blink an eye. She is very verbally present. For others, movement. This is myself. I can be very kinesthetically present. I can do 10 things at once. My husband, Dave, who's on this call, is astounding. He will be watching TV, having his iPad, and a magazine next to him and be visually absorbing all three things and taking it all in. He can handle a ton of visual information at the same time. So equally for producing sorting or um, alpha waves, for some, talking puts them in this state. It may sound like, oh, I could do this, but gosh, I really would like to do this. I wonder if we go over here, maybe we can try going over here. What they're doing is what I may consider kind of verbally wandering. They're actually weighing out options verbally. They're sorting through. For others, this kinesthetic helps them do that. So moving things around. I don't know what how I want this room designed until I actually get a chance to move the furniture around or all those post-it sticky note ideas on the wall. I need to move them around to really sort my thinking. These are ways in which this kind of thinking will show up. And for others visually, right? They need to have three or four different documents open and be pasting and putting things in. So, and then equally for open attention, right? For some, 
standing up and walking around puts them in this state of attention. For others, listening for too long will put them in this state of attention. I was this child in school. Angie's a really good student, but she's a daydreamer. She always seems slightly checked out. I was sitting and listening as a student, and by sitting in a rigid school environment, my brain was producing these open imaginative ideas. So in meetings, when you have people, engineers are often use this pattern. So they take a while to actually say something because their state of mind is in this theta open state. And so if they want to express something verbally that's very sequential or detailed, it may take them a minute to get there. So I know that's kind of a lot, um, and there's so much more on this model that I'm happy to share with you. But for today, I just wanted to highlight the with teams, how we translate this is that often when we see breakdowns that we attribute to content or we attribute to um, maybe personalities, that it literally, oh my gosh, this um, Zoom bubble thing is coming up with my hand gestures. It happens a lot for someone like me who uses my hands a lot, um, these random bubbles, um, is that there's more that could be going on here and you can support both your one-on-one -on -one coaching and your team coaching and your team facilitation, basically anything that you're trying to do to drive team effectiveness by having awareness that if someone is checked out in a meeting or they seem checked out, that they actually may be in this open state of attention. And what's really going on is they are brewing a fantastic idea and they just need the space to do that. That for some, um, if I see them being messy or, or what would appear in, in my role to be disorganized, that actually visual organization isn't their preferred way of organizing, that they may organize by piles. For some, it's very difficult to remember exact words and you'll have another person who maybe that isn't true for, correct language or say, you said this, right? And that can often create a little you know, frustration with one another. So for some to remember exactly what is said in meetings, they do, they need to write down, or I know with all the AI apps that are great, and there's many in this, in this Zoom call today where there's transcriptions, that's great. For some that actually will allow them to listen better knowing the exact notes are being taken. Uh, on one of our team calls, one of my colleagues said, you know, she's really, she's been sitting for three hours. It's really hard to sit and listen for much longer. To give people the permission to get up and move in the back of the room, especially if we're trying to create a different kind and quality of thinking in a meeting. Collaborative intelligence is about trying to yield the highest quality of thinking. And again, with this model, we realize that for some that's moving around, for others that's standing on a whiteboard, for others that's using post-it notes, or they may need five minutes of silence in order to gather their ideas first. So all these diverse ways of showing up actually can increase the quality of thinking versus just sitting and listening to the leader at the front of the room. If we want higher quality engagement, then we have to give people permission to really show up with their whole brain. <laughs> and part of that is um, allowing for some of these um, ways in which we're communicating to the group to expand um, and also to notice as a practitioner, when the thinking is stuck, you're, you're hearing a team and they're just keeps circulating like an eddy in a river going around an issue the same at the same time. You have to support breaking out of how they're thinking together. So if they're just verbally sitting around and discussing, 
than to suggest, hey, can we all take and write what's most critical to us on a post-it right now and put it up on the wall? Or if we're on Zoom, I would love for people to just even take a two second break, walk around the room and come back. We have to, in order for us to change how we're communicating, or sorry, the result of our collaboration, we have to change up how we're communicating in that moment. So I'm hoping today what you walk away with is that when the brain is stuck, whether it's with an individual or a team, to change how we're communicating is a tool available to you at all times. That to invite when a group or an individual is confused, that could be a good thing to hold space for that confusion and to shift and support them in that shift and how they're working through that confusion. So if I'm just been talking to an individual and I, they're like, I just still am really grappling with this. Some things I might suggest in the moment are, you know what, why don't you stand up in the back of the room here and just take a minute? Or do you have a favorite piece of music? Let's put that on for two, you know, just two minutes. All I'm trying to do is shift the brain waves that are happening in that moment so we can get a different kind of thinking coming forward. I'll end with a, a, a bit of a story. I was working with a team in Europe and the Netherlands and anyone here has worked with the Dutch before? This was a global team, but there's a very powerful Dutchman. And everyone warned me before working with this team, this guy, he just constantly will not let his point alone. He's like a dog who grabs onto something and he will not let that point go until we all you know, go, yes, we get it. And I was like, huh, I wonder what's really going on there from this lens. So lo and behold, in the next meeting, oh, they're all talking about strategy for the following year. And he kept interrupting and saying, but we have to dot, 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 dot. And the same point over and over again. I was like, oh, I think it may support the group. I'm going to go up to that flip chart and write in big red ink what he's saying. And I did. And for the rest of the time, he actually didn't interrupt because he could see his words and they were visually present. So the whole group could recognize the importance that he felt because he couldn't register that people were listening. So he needed to visually see to recognize, oh, my words are out there in the room. So it's just a small example of these shifts that we may propose at any given moment. Again, where a team or an individual is stuck in one domain, if they're stuck auditorily, they keep talking themselves in circles or visually, there's been a lot of information exchange and people are like agitated. If we can support the shift in how we're communicating, we may in fact open people up and get a different result for performance. So, um, I would love to open it up to questions, insights, what you've experienced, um, either with that communication cycle, how you support teams and building really real-time collaborative intelligence tools. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Julie, would you like to yes, handle the sure. Q&A? Angie. Angie, thank you. I, I'm just, my mind is really definitely opened up here. Um, I wanted to call on Jonathan. Jonathan, you've put some comments in the chat. I'm noticing the one about psychological safety, and then you followed up on that. Would you like to come off mute and ask a question or make a point? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first off, I mean, there's only so much you can say in the time that you have. So, and you you already warned us, this is part of the picture. But I'm, I'm curious about how you see psychological safety fitting into and adding to what you already described. Yeah, it's, um, it's so important. And how I have seen it show up in my own work is people get, afraid to speak in meetings, right? Because maybe their language isn't as polished or maybe they came from a different company and they still don't understand 
all the verbal acronyms and cute, sexy words that people are saying. And so the, the awareness of their own language becomes, and, and, and what does fitting into this team verbally look like? And so that, you know, in itself. So when people aren't really contributing in a team, um, I think creating safety around that and kind of going back to, I'm sure many of you have heard that trace beginner's mind, right? Especially when it's a new team member, creating space and saying, you know what, you all have been working together for a long time. You have a lot of norms that are intuitive that just, you know, you don't, this person here, we need to really come back to beginner's mind. If you say something that others on this call will get intuitively, make sure you make space for them to ask questions. So I think as a, that's, a, I'm learning the Crentis model of facilitator versus practitioner, you know, all coaching. So, but I think that the facilitation of creating as much safety as you can and equally for visual. So it's really interesting when people get exposed to this model. One of the things I most commonly hear is, Angie, I've been so overwhelmed on Slack. Like there's a thousand things happening in that world. And I feel like just incompetent to keep up. And they were thinking it's something wrong with them. It was visual overload. And so, and when a team has a norm of how they're communicating, right, heavily reliant on these tools and someone who thinks differently or visual can put them into this state of overwhelm quickly, how do we manage that and how do we support that person and how do they support themselves becomes part of the really necessary work. Could I have yeah. one additional question? That's yeah. related. I'm wondering to what degree you also bring um, cultural differences and reasons why people might not speak up, gender, race, ethnicity, other differences. Um, do you make that explicit as a way of understanding what may be happening in the room? 100%. I mean, I'm a big fan of the work of the culture map. I don't know if you've been exposed to that. I think that has given a lot of really good language and a way for us to even have understanding of cultural differences. This model here, um, it has cultural influences. For example, you know, I did a lot of work in China and especially the Chinese females who were leading. It was very uncommon for them to speak first, right? There's, or even if they had something to say, it was a soft question that would come forward. Whereas the man would be like, we're doing this. And that was their way of, you know, that for them, that was very culturally normal. Of course, you take that same norm to Germany or other countries and you're gonna run into trouble. So, yes, yeah, so I think, you know, that's that the body of work of global teams and really understanding how this model shows up um, for you, for your culture and just giving language. And again, I go back to that cycle. If we can just take time to understand and and not put it into a characterization of, oh, Jonathan, he's just that quiet engineer who doesn't say anything over in the corner. Right. Like those type of things just box us in, in a way that doesn't create high collaboration. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. Kate, you want to come off mute and pose your question? Yeah. I was just curious about, you know, all the conventional wisdom out around out there about multitasking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and you mentioned, you know, Dave's sort of have, Bring multiple, you know, media on at the same time. So I'm curious about how that all, how that conversation can happen. It's a beautiful uh, question. Yeah. It's a beautiful question. So in the, just from the lens of this model, multitasking for those who visual information puts them in this state of mind in a beta, they can handle a lot of visual information at the same time. That's my husband, Dave. Similar for me, kinesthetically, I can be doing several things at the same time and often do it. Actually, I feel good doing that. But if I had to listen to a lot of things at the same time, I could not auditorily multitask. 
For some, they can. So if you take the word multitasking and you take it one level deeper of what is the sensory input and in that multitasking, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you, we've, we've had people who can handle three conversations at once. They're kind of listening to a radio program here, kind of talking on the phone and paying attention. My brain would go into overload very quickly. So in my client work, when, you know, with exec, especially executives, and I'm, I'm sure many of you find this true, is we need more space to think. So multitasking, whatever that looks like, right, can often do a disservice to that ability to come back to what flow looks like, which is where our brains are going very quickly from focus to sorting to expanded and so these moments of coherence, which I know we want to get to to end this call right now as well, that's a big breath in between the multitasking. So I equally as people are like, I just need to do more. <laughs> so I'm going to more multitask. Okay. How can you do it in a way that works for your brain to do that? That isn't so taxing. Mm -hmm. And how do you create the parentheses to that, which is more time for flow? Mm -hmm. Because if you just get someone who's highly into doing so many things at the same time and that uh, energy, it's, it has to have a balancing structure. That's, that's where I take the work with, with both teams and individuals. Right. I'm going to ask one more question, Angie. I'm just sitting here shaking my head because this is so helpful. Um, Peter, I'll put your question out there for Angie about coaching questions for working with a team where there's some reluctance to participate mm -hmm. and ask yeah. you to wrap on that question. Okay. I mean, that's a big question and it's a beautiful question and it's, you know, I probably can't do service to the complexity of that question in this amount of time, because I think all of us have facets of that answer that we kind of have to hold together. Um, so reluctance to participate. So is that a power dynamic? Um, one of the things that when I'm working with a team and we're saying we are here to collaborate. So we're not here to make a decision. We're not here to um, share information. We're actually here to collaborate. We're here to think together about this problem. Often collaboration is mistaken for cooperation, meaning all getting along. That's groupthink, or you share a lot of common values or a lot of things, and it can feel good, right? Because y'all think the same. It can be mistaken for competition, meaning I want to one up, or if Kate is in the room and I'm used to having her have a better idea than me, but I really want to look good today, I'm going to try and like compete against her by idea, you know, pushing an idea forward. The third one is around compromise. And this is where, to your question, I see often. And I'm kind of tuning into if the dynamic over time has been no matter what I say, change doesn't happen, or no matter what I contribute, I don't feel received or I don't feel listened to, um, then I'm always compromising my own voice in a collaborative space. So of course, then some work has to be done with the team. Is the team effectiveness requiring full contribution from everyone? My stance is yes. So. Thank you. Janice? Angie and Dave, thank you so much for being here, Angie love your book um, my, my entire last summer was full of <laughs> engaging with your book in multiple multiple ways so thank you so much it has been a joy and a pleasure to have you here thank you everyone for being here and sharing your your 45 minutes on a friday and with that i will give you a couple minutes to breathe and a couple seconds to share my gratitude for you being here and to transition you back to where you once were. Enjoy your Friday, enjoy your weekend, 
Thank you so much. It's been a, been a pleasure.